Okay, so hi everybody, welcome. Hope you're doing fine. Uh, welcome to this morning of FACO Mentors. It's an honor for us to be here with this amazing panel. Dr. David Lockington from UK, Dr. Borja Salvador from the wonderful Barcelona, and Dr. Ishtake Anwar from Bangladesh. Thank you guys for being here with us. We already have one of our uh, amazing videos that Dr. Maria Belen Silva from Ecuador sent us. And Jorge, who's going to be translating, also has another amazing uh, video. And then we're going to try to you know, bring people up from the audience and from the chat to talk about this, uh, this topic that we really think it's 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 important it's very important right to understand uh this journey this uh path we need to to go by uh, if we want to become cataract surgeons so i'm going to start very quick um sharing my screen here you know i welcome everybody to the fake mentors community let's see right here Okay, and always with this, with this quote, with this mantra, right? We are stronger together. And I think um, technology, you know, bring us closer the, the, after this COVID uh, epidemic. So we're gonna keep using technology to build this community, to make it stronger and, and to be uh, closer together. So we're gonna start asking people where they're from. Uh, we have a lot of people from from our community, you know, we have, as we're gonna tell you, we're using even WhatsApp to, to be in touch. Uh, we have Dr. Julio Atencio from Medellin, Colombia. We're gonna put him in the panel as well. He has um, amazing concepts to share with us. Dr. Felipe Berta from Uruguay, welcome guys. Uh, Norca from Peru, oh, Norca, is, it's great to have you here. We had you like uh, on Saturday doing amazing questions about uh, about what we talk, right? About how, how we can organize to have better businesses and better clinics. Uh, Luis Lagos from Honduras. Oh, so I love this, right? Because the country, the, the world actually makes, it becomes small because we have people from, from everybody, from everywhere, sorry. Okay, so this is how the fakeomentors.com um, homepage looks like. And we encourage you, you know, to go to the, um, homepage to go to social media to follow us there to give us uh, good um, videos so we can share with the entire community and we're going to start the, this virtual class by expanding our comfort zone I think uh, you know you can find so many talks and so many classes about how to do a capsular rexis but today we're going to do something different we're going to see this journey from outside, right? I want I want Borja to tell me how was the journey to become a cataract surgeon? How how can you know learn from him to do it more efficiently now that there's many people from the community who are who are starting and learning. Uh, we we encourage you guys to follow up follow us in social media. As you guys know, you know, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram are a communication channel, so please follow us there the youtube channel that is right here you know we already have amazing videos it, it, dr yamane was kind enough to give us uh, a video that it's only in fake mentors uh dr uh, takashi nakano from brazil as well dr jackie bells from um from australia so 
again, this is very important, guys. Uh, we would love to have videos from you, short videos, but they are powerful and they learn, they teach us a lot. Um, also, remember those who are not in the WhatsApp group from Pico Mentors, you just you know grab your phone, take a picture here, and you will automatically automatically go into the WhatsApp group. Um, then um, this is uh, we're, we're doing this in, in 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 English as well. Dr. Ivan Basanta from Spain was kind enough to just uh, just to grab all the webinars that Ophthalmo University did, and so we have a, a digital book that has all the webinars, and you know you can have it categorized. So they're going to be in English as well. So we're going to share with you uh, the ones who speak English, all the webinars we did in English, and you will have a link to enter those guys. So it's an honor to start to start now. Uh, I present them already. I will love for, for them also to present themselves, especially where they are, in which centers, in which city, and you know um, um, they're teaching cataract surgery. So I will love for them to tell us their story. I'm going to... I'm gonna do a quick introduction. And basically, I think that this uh, picture tells a lot about how the journey is gonna be. It's gonna be like climbing the Everest, guys. And guess what? You, you, you're never gonna reach to the top, right? Because it, even, even I'm sure all of them, you know, you, you can always improve a little better. You can always learn a new technique. There's gonna be always a new device that you need to master. So, Again, guys, um, I think we're going to see this path, this journey from outside, and these masters are going to tell us a lot of their secrets. So that, this is the, the, the key, right? So we all want to be a master. We all want to be this Yoda and, you know, have all this knowledge and all this algorithm to face any single situation. But uh, we need to understand what is, what is mastery. I, I, I can't get enough of talking about that mastery is not something, you know, you're born a master or you have this genetics, you know, you, you're going to be so talented that you don't need to learn. Uh, we believe that master is a function of time and intense focus on an applied particular field of knowledge. Um, and, and many of you, maybe we, we look like this, right? A baby Yoda. So the only thing I'm going to say here, I'm going to let, let the other uh, masters talk, is I would love you to understand that what's going to happen in time when you start practicing, when you start doing some deliberate practice. In the beginning, right, you're going to start learning what to do. You, you, you're not going to you're going to know how to put your hands, how to do a capsular rexis, how to move, how to pivot, how to have a center eye. And, and that's good. That's going to be a first level in your journey. The second, uh, uh, the second uh, step is when you become good. Sorry about this. Let's see. Oh, here. It's when you become good and you start having acceptable outcomes in normal eyes. Then is when you can become great, right? You have repeatability every time you do... Um, uh, a fake or surgery, you know, you're going to have the same outcomes, the same size of the capsular rexis. You're going to face complex cases. You're going to face complications. And then mastery, in my opinion, is when you get, when you have creativity and you can be a mentor for other people, uh, especially you can, you know, uh, uh, design new devices, new techniques. So this is how the journey looks like. In, in my humble opinion. So I would love for the panel, you know, to tell us secrets, how we can make this more efficient. Uh, the four tips I like is to have goals. You really need to say, okay, uh, you know, I have a goal that in three months, I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna do that. And SMART is an amazing um, way to, to, to talk about your goals. There need to be a specific, measurable, achievable, realistic and you put a time on them the second thing i'm from uruguay and i love soccer and this is the loco abreu i don't know if you remember this guy you know the amazing penalty kick in in south africa in 2010 and i love this about putting emotion and meaning in what you do every time you put emotion and meaning uh 
things become easier. The second thing is about uh, benchmarking. And I love this as a CrossFit uh, sports guy. You know, every time I want to master something, I don't say I'm going to go from point A to point B, like in in no time. I put, you know, I do this called benchmarkings and milestones. I go baby steps to that goal, right? So every time you do that, measure your progress, uh, ask for feedback, and you're going to get your goals. And the last one is about deliberate practice. You can see Stephen Curry there with two basketballs. And we all, we all know that you will never have two basketballs in, in, in a in a basketball game, but he trains in a way that, you know, he's going to be smart when he's in the court. And I think we can do a lot about that. Uh, the masters are going to talk a lot, a lot about this, how, what we can do outside that we're going to be better inside. So I, got, I want you guys to see the panel already. I think the panel is uh, specifically designed to have somebody from UK, somebody from Spain, somebody from Bangladesh, and you know, uh, and me being from Uruguay and Mexico, so um, we're gonna also have videos from colleagues. Uh, and I would love uh, David to start up with your concepts about what you, th how we can improve the the learning curve. Thank you, Evo. That's a brilliant introduction about the principles behind learning, and I love the example of sports people. If you've ever been at a sports event, you will notice that the professionals practice before their game, play their game, and then are straight back practicing again. And that's something we need to think about in terms of surgery. Let me just share my screen. Okay, so I became a consultant in 2013. And as part of that, I had a brand new theater suite open for me, brand new equipment, brand new clinics, and it was amazing. Except I was given the brand new trainees to teach for cataract surgery. And that often happens to the new guy. And that's fine, but it is frightening whenever you are a new consultant and you have someone who has no idea what to do. And so very quickly, I became interested in how do I train without trouble? How can we do this safely? And hopefully some of these principles we're gonna talk about will help you in your situation. We are supposed to live in a world of evidence-based medicine, but we know that actually we live in a world of eminence-based medicine. What did the prof say? What did my boss say? And then we move from that as we get more mature into my own experience. But I would challenge you that if good judgment comes from experience and experience comes from bad judgment, why make the mistakes yourself? Let others make the mistakes, learn from them. So you don't have to go through that and your patients don't have to go through that. And that is the point of being well trained. In the UK, there are a lot of surveys of training to see if it's of good quality, but they keep asking the question, how confident are you with doing a FACO? How confident are you with dealing with vitreous loss? And I believe that is the wrong focus. We should be interested in, are you competent? If you know what you're doing, then you will be confident. If you don't know what you're doing and your training is bad, then you will not be confident. So I encourage you to do the simple things well, do the basics well and get those foundations correct so then you can handle the more complex situations. Here's an example from my mentor, Larry Benjamin. In his unit, he identified that the cortex removal stage was the time when most capsule rupture occurred and they moved from metal tips to silicon tips and they no longer cause capsule rupture during IA. And I took that on board in my training unit and I insist that all my first year trainees use a silicon tip IA because it's safer and it stops the complication. 
And hopefully this video will show that as the trainee learns the techniques, there's a lot more space, it's a lot safer. And then in the future, they can go on to using the metal by manual. There's different techniques for different situations, but you want to allow them to be competent before you push them into a more complex situation. We should all be keeping records of what we do. That's one of the requirements of being a surgical trainee. But the logbook only shows what you have done. It does not show what you need to do. And we need to ask ourselves, where are the gaps in our learning? And how do I address those gaps through knowledge and experience? So you want to ask yourself, as we did in Scotland, have you experience of using capsule tension rings? And if not, how do we teach that before the time you actually need to use it? This is the stages of competency, which is very important. If you think about it, we all start at unconscious incompetent. We don't even know what we don't know. Then we start trying to do it and we realize, I really don't know what I'm doing here. But the more practice, you start to be able to do it, but you're uncertain. Eventually, it's like tying your shoelaces. It's easy now, but at the start, it was not. And that competence will encourage you to be confident. So this is my most important slide. This is how to become competent in any surgical task. If you don't know it exists, you can't learn it. So you, we need to read, we need to watch, we need to make use of great resources like the FACO mentors and other things like that. We then practice the foundations through safe simulation on the ICVR magic simulator, in the dry lab with the plastic eyes, in the wet lab sometimes with tissue eyes. Then you perform it under supervision and only when you can do it independently are you competent, but that's not enough. Don't become proud, don't become arrogant. Record everything, review and refine your surgeries to improve your skills. So here's an example of simulation. On the right, as I look at the screen, we have the simulator computer. On the left, we have a plastic eye to show you how to use a Malugan ring. You're not gonna wake up one day, see a small pupil and think, today's the day I'm gonna shove in a Malugan ring. You're gonna practice it first, make sure you know the concepts, and then know what you do before you do it. So here's a video I made of myself messing around on the simulator, showing that the scrolls don't always go in, but learning how I can move my hand to manipulate it in, in the safe environment. And if I wreck it here, it doesn't matter. It's a computer game. Then taking those principles forward into a clinical scenario, you'll see here as I put the viscoelastic on the pupil, it's not very big but I'll engage that scroll and you'll see that this scroll does not perfectly go in. But because I've practiced it, I don't panic. I keep my introducer hand still. I put in my second instrument and I can guide that scroll in because I've practiced this. I'm not inventing this. I'm applying what I have previously learned. And then to remove the scroll, obviously you take the further one away to get space. You can do the handshake technique to get it back into the introducer. And I would recommend you use your second instrument to protect the endothelium from those scrolls and it comes out safely. So we learned the task and now we're thriving by delivering the task safely. I have a couple of final thoughts about our attitude. You can't really say that, oh, this is an easy case. Every case could become complicated. But if you know what techniques are available, what tools are available to help you, you can simplify the high risk by using them appropriately but you can only use them appropriately if you know how to through practice. And so I would encourage you, don't be arrogant. You can only say a case is simple when it's be completed safely. We all need to learn. And if we have the default attitude, this could go wrong, then we'll be prepared to address those. And hopefully it won't go wrong. Hopefully it'll go brilliantly, but you're prepared to get the patient the best outcome. So thank you very much. Thank you, as always, David. Amazing concepts, very clear, uh, and you know a lot to learn from them. Um, we have people now, if we think about it, from Latin America. We have people from Europe. We have a lot of people from Asia, from Bangladesh, and, for example, Dr. Kostkova from Macedonia. 
So everybody has a different uh, reality. And we're gonna ask the audience the first questions that we have. Uh, and it's, it's a tricky questions because it's the questions we always, we always ask. It's how many, oh, which is the number of cataract surgery you perform during residency? Because we tend to, you know, always think about this number as the most important thing in the residency, right? How many cataracts did you do? We don't ask, did you learn or did you, or, or did, did you not learn? But and the second question, it, it's, it's about to, to, to make you, you know, think a little bit about which are the most impo important aspects in your learning curve. Is, is it a good mentor? Is it the number? Or is it, for example, good equipment to do the, uh, the, those questions? So uh, when we're just analyzing what people think, we have Do Dr. Maria Belen Silva from Ecuador that actually we had an amazing, um, you know, um, relationship from the past uh, three or four months, always, you know, talking about her learning experience. She's in an amazing learning curve and learning very, very fast. And she was kind enough to send us, uh, you know, uh, a video and it's a slide and she's going to talk about her journey. So Dr. Dr. Silva, welcome. You're mute, you're mute. You, you need to unmute yourself. Doctora, we, we cannot hear you, you're mute. Okay, so just very, very, very quick. Uh, you know, I wanted to, to, to say that we have a lot of people here that will, were not able to do okay. surgery in the residency. It's almost like 50 percent, okay. but, but very, very interesting. 80% uh, of uh, people with us is telling us that the best thing to have is a good mentor during cataract surgery. That's very good. So, Dr. Silva, please. Put the presentation so we can see the entire screen. Okay, se está ahí. No, no, abajo, abajo donde está la pantallita, ahí, justo donde está el cursor, tiene que apretarla. ¿Dónde? No, no lo veo. No lo veo. A ver, no, no me sale. Abajo al lado donde dice 75%. Y lo que yo hago. Acá, acá arriba está acá. Ahí. No, 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 no. Ahí. Ahí, ahí. Ok. How to make it more efficient. Number one, count on an excellent tutor which is compromised in helping and teaching us. Also, to keep an adequate and good communication with him or her. To have a specific and individualized learning plan. Number three, having the technological and economic resource as the equipment that is needed to perform the surgical procedure and solve the possible complications that may occur. Four, have a good working slash learning environment. Number five, knowing and manage my visualization system perfectly. Good use and handle of the microscope because without a good view, I can't do the surgery. Also, manage the vacuum machine, especially the parameters we need to use so the performance of the surgical act won't be compromised. Number six, acquire the most modal skill and learn how to synchronize them as an example during this COVID or group realization, we use both of our hands and feet 
and we should have a good view to make good decisions. Number seven, realize with lab, with artificial pork eyes as possible. So this can let us practice with microscope and real vacuification equipment to set the most model skills before we have to do the procedure in a human being. Eight, have ethics and be responsible with our patients before developing any surgical skills. Thank you. I'm sorry. No, oh, thank you very much, doctor. Um, and, and I really like that, you know, organization and very, a lot of points and very, very specific. Uh, there, there's a lot of things here. Um, Borja, what do you think about all these items that the doctor uh, was describing about that learning curve? I mean, she, she Dr. Silva uh, raised a lot of the main uh, key points that we as instructors uh, have to focus on during um, our instructorship. And uh, I totally agree with uh, what uh, David uh, says in the chat, that uh, I don't believe in uh, surgical numbers representing uh, how good uh, a trainee is. I believe in, in, in quality ver uh, above uh, quantity. And it's something that I will talk about in my, in my talk briefly. And because uh, it doesn't, it, it's not important whether you have done 200 cases, 300 cases, if you do not learn how to do them well and you um, don't stratify them uh, based on the high risk, low, medium risk and low risk cases, uh, you will become a, a kamikaze once you finish your, your training. So that's not what we want to, to do. That's what we want our, our young trainees to become. And I, I totally agree with uh, those comments from David. Very good. So some insights, Ishtake? Uh, she has pointed out uh, all those things. And uh, I totally agree with the Borja that, you know, when uh, we are doing our training, we think that number is a big uh, thing. We need to do a lot of cases. But uh, as he said, that uh, quality over quantity. You know, if you do two cases perfectly, two rexes perfectly, it's better than 20 rexes is going all around, messing up, you know, and somebody trying to help. So we should try to concentrate on the quality thing try to achieve that thing perfectly rather than doing many of the uh, cases. But uh, as we are resident, you know, sometimes we feel that uh, we are asking to our mentors that, you know, try to give more cases, but uh, it should be the other way around. Uh, focus on that case that you have got and try to do it perfectly. Very good. So uh, we have other videos from other colleagues around the world. But Borja, you had something for us, something prepared for us, uh, we would love to share. All right, then, while I prepare, I, I would like to thank Ivo for the kind invitation. I'm very happy to be here among all of us to, uh, this afternoon, and greetings from Barcelona. Um, before I, I start with my very short presentation, I, I was asked by, Ivo asked me to kind of like give you a, a brief uh, picture on of, of how the training um, is uh, in, in Spain and also focused on, on cataract surgery training. So, but I, I would like to, to mention that I am, uh, I'm, I was born in Barcelona. I did my residency in Barraquer. And then after that, I moved to the US where I spent like on five and a half years doing uh, research mostly on keratoprosthesis in Boston with a, a great mentor, Dr. Dolman. And then I, I moved back to clinics by, by um, taking a fellowship uh, in cataract and, and cornea uh, I, in Newcastle under the mentorship of uh, Professor Figueiredo. And then I, I moved back to Barcelona where I've been a consultant since uh, 2016, I believe. I don't remember right now. I have a little bit of a short uh, uh, memory loss right now. But um, so the, why am I saying this? Uh, because I've seen how the um, English-based system works, which uh, is very different to that uh, in, in Spain. And uh, I think that we, we could uh, learn a lot from, from a lot of the, the, 
the well-organized system that they have for, uh, for training. So first I would like to, to tell you a little bit about what it entails to become an ophthalmologist in Spain. So basically after high school, uh, you graduate from high school, you have to take an exam uh, to enter a university. And uh, if you have very good degrees, you, you go into medical school, which takes six years um, of uh, learning. After that, uh, we have to take an exam that is similar to the USMLE clinical knowledge exam, uh, which is called MIR, M -I -R, and uh, that usually takes uh, about eight months to prepare and to take the exam. You, it usually have, you usually finish medical school around June, and uh, the exam is in January, February uh, of the next, the next year. And then based on the uh, score that you get in the exam and also uh, your, um, your degrees from medical school, you, we are ranked uh, basically with number one being the best student and the whatever, 7,000 or 8,000 being the worst, quote unquote. And uh, based on that ranking, uh, you are uh, eligible to choose a residency program. Uh, and this is for every single specialty in, in Spain. So if you are lucky enough to, to select the residency program that you, that you were looking for, uh, you enter the program and then you do the residency in ophthalmology, which takes uh, uh, four years in Spain. So as you can see, it's an 11 year journey just to become an ophthalmologist, uh, quite a long one. Uh, it's shorter than the, the residency program in, in the UK. I know it's about seven years, so it's not the, I, we cannot complain that much, but uh, I know that there are other programs that are a little bit shorter. So as like I mentioned, it's a four year program. Uh, basically you do a three to six monthly rotations. And the idea is that you uh, go over every single subspecialty in, 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 in ophthalmology and uh, as a resident you must keep a, 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 what it's called the book of the resident which is uh, kind of like a diary it's not something that they know anybody will ask for I mean you will not get uh, a better score or a better uh, evaluation uh, if depending on what the your book of the resident says but it's something that uh, it is mandatory for every resident and they should keep it um, updated because at any given point uh, somebody can ask uh, about number of surgeries they've done a number of uh, meetings they've attended uh, ground rounds and, and, and publications and, and so on no? there the every resident has a tutor uh, a tutor throughout the, the four years that uh, basically provides with guidance and help especially when um, as a young trainee, you're facing uh, problems with, uh, they can be personal problems, uh, they can be um, training problems, they can be problems with your own boss, with your um, uh, consultant. And uh, so you have this person who's supposed to be objective and, 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 and looking things from outside, uh, who's supposed to guide you and help you in, in those difficult situation, the situations. And, um, but in the end, even though the Minister of Health gives us some general guidelines, which, is, which are more like a declaration of minimums, to be honest, I've, I've read them through. This is uh, uh, something that the, 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 the Spanish government publishes and it's open to anybody. And yes, it's very well stratified, but um, it doesn't have enough substance. So in the end, um, teaching, relies on and depends on, on each hospital. And that is based on whether the hospital is a big hospital, whether uh, it, the hospital is based in a big city or a small city. So depending on that, um, the trainee will be more exposed to uh, certain types of cases, a certain volume of patients, and uh, it may be exposed to uh, uh, smaller or bigger um, number of, of attendings or, or, and, and mentors. So it's kind of like a leap of faith in a certain way, even though, I mean, the system works very well in the, in the public sector, but it's not very well um, specified what, what we need to do as instructors or as mentors uh, to uh, help our young uh, trainees develop those skills that we were discussing about. So yes, it's true that the, the training requirements um, are, um, 
based on, on increasing levels of responsibility, but in the end, it's not like in the UK where they have appraisals every six months and uh, uh, they have to show that they've achieved all those, all that knowledge, both um, clinical knowledge and, and surgical knowledge uh, to move forward. Uh, we just have a fit or versus not fit uh, evaluation at the end of the residency. And to, for somebody to be not fit, to be considered not fit, um, that person has to do something like a outrageous, uh, I don't know, like a, almost like killing, killing a patient, you know, uh, or uh, uh, having a, a psychotic uh, attack or things like that. I mean, as long as you kind of like do things well, you're fit, okay? And that is where, where, my, uh, where I think that we should and, uh, improve. When it comes to cataract surgery, what the guidelines say is that they're kind of conf very confusing because it, it says, okay, the trainee must complete uh, at least 50 procedures with an increasing level of autonomy. But that includes cataract surgery, glaucoma surgery or laser uh, treatment and refractive surgery. But uh, it doesn't say how many cases they must perform as independent surgeons or as supervised surgeons or, um, I mean, it doesn't, they, it doesn't say whether those procedures have to be complete or, uh, I don't know, let's say 50 capsular exits should be enough. So there are no specific guidelines on how to teach or learn cataract surgery. Uh, nonetheless, uh, I would say that uh, in, in, in the public uh, hospitals, the residents uh, end up doing like 50 to 100 procedures, uh, cataract surgeries, I mean. Um, some places they do less, some places they do more. It depends on, like I said, on on the hospital. But to me, this looks like uh, teaching a boy to swim by just throwing them in the, in the swimming pool. It's, it's, very, it's, it, it, it's very scary, you know? <laughs> because I mean, sometimes it's like, okay, here's the patient, this is a cataract, this is the fake machine, just carry on. And as a, as a trainee, you feel like, uh, I don't know where to begin. So um, what would be my wish, wish list? And this is a very short wish list. And, and as I was putting these three points together, I, I was coming up with more and more uh, points that you, we should address. But I think that these are kind of like a, a summary of, of, of the main points that we should address. First of all, I think that we should uh, have clear guidelines, uh, ho hopefully in conjunction with the Spanish uh, Society of Ophthalmology, uh, because we are the ones who know uh, what cataract surgery is. We are the ones who know how to learn cataract surgery because we've been through that uh, with more or less pain. Uh, and so we are the ones who, who can tell uh, the Ministry of, of Health, how to um, really create those guidelines so our junior trainees become more and more uh, excellent in, 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 in cataract surgery. Like, like we mentioned before, I, I believe, I strongly believe in quality over quantity. Uh, something that I always tell my, my junior trainees now that I have the, I'm the, the honor of, 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 of supervising some of their uh, surgeries is like, Speed doesn't impress me. I mean, I uh, there, there's this like fight about oh, I can do a cutter uh, case in ten minutes. Oh, I can do it in seven minutes. I can do it in six minutes. Yes, it is true that a very experienced surgeons can perform a cataract surgery safely in a very short period of time, but you cannot you cannot expect that from the get go. This is about basically volume numbers and knowing first of all what you have to do and optimizing those those steps so um i always tell them look i just want you to do to take one step at a time always think why and how and uh, you are doing that step and i don't care about uh, whether you it takes like 45 minutes the first cataract or, or 60 minutes i remember my first case when i was a resident i think it took me like over an hour i was sweating at the end and, uh, and now, I mean, obviously, uh, many years later, I'm, I'm, I'm more confident in, in, in my surgery skills. And then I, I, I'm, I'm not rushing, but I take much, much less time in performing my cases. The only uh, inconvenience is that because of the burden of care in some hospitals, because of the waiting list, um, sometimes there's so much pressure on the consultants that um, numbers, uh, 
speak in numbers, uh, like we say, los números mandan, no? In Spanish, like, um, uh, so basically you cannot take that time to clearly um, teach your junior trainee uh, because you you have all this long list that needs to be performed by, by the end of the morning. So that's something that we should definitely work on. And then I think that we have mentioned a little bit about this uh, in the chat that we have to create real increasing levels of autonomy. And I would, uh, I, I, I like to take this step-by-step -step, uh, procedure starting from the back. So this is something that I've been, I mean, I don't know, thinking about. And uh, I don't believe that a first year resident is able to perform a full case and we should not put that pressure on that person. So I'm a, like Ivo knows, I'm a, a, an IC surgical simulator instructor and I, I'm very happy with this tool. It's a very um, uh, helpful tool, especially uh, for young trainees and for those uh, uh, surgeons who have been out of practice for a while to regain those skills. So I, I think that the reasonable approach would be that the first year resident would start with the simulator, like David mentioned in his talk. I always advise uh, to have an instructor, even with the IC simulator, because it's not the same, because every single detail um, counts and the way that people place their hands on the head, the way they, they hold the, the instruments is key to become a, a, an excellent surgeon. And I would probably um, oblige somehow, I don't like the word, but a minimum flight, hours of flight before real surgery, like they do with the airplane uh, pilots, okay? That person needs to show me that I can trust him with some of the procedures because the patient safety, safety comes first. And um, the only downside of this machine is that, as we all know, it's very expensive, but there are other uh, uh, simulators that are uh, more affordable and that are equally um, equally helpful, like uh, the iLab, for example, uh, from uh, Fabiano Brandao in, in Brazil. The second year, I would start with, the, with real surgery cases, IOL implantation and pre-scholastic aspiration. We start with that. We see how, how the, pers the, the resin does. Uh, obviously, I would say like a minimum mandatory amount. I, I don't like numbers, but uh, you know, the guidelines are always like, to be like, a, they need to put a, a certain number. And then after that, if, if the, 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 the resident has shown enough skills, we can move on to incisions, maybe capsulorexis, maybe grooving and move uh, forward, okay? And that would, uh, would allow us to, um, to reach the third and the fourth years with enough skills to perform full cases, either supervised or unsupervised, okay? I don't believe that supervised cases um, should uh, be uh, considered less valuable. I don't believe in that. I think that as long as you are a trainee, you should always be supervised somehow, either, either, either by being in the, in the OR or maybe by reviewing the videos, okay? But, uh, but at least as a third or four year resident, you should be able to perform a full case, a low risk full case, and maybe with a, uh, with a good mentor and and enough supervision, maybe move on to like more uh, difficult cases. And as always, I, I mean, obviously this is a, a flexible based um, suggestion because every resin is, is different. Every person is different and some uh, people move uh, faster than others. So um, I think that uh, in Spain, we have a lot of room to, for improvement. And uh, I would love to see that little by little, maybe we can start implementing all these changes because I, I've seen them work in, in, in the UK and in the US. They have a, uh, some of these things uh, already implemented. And I'm, here we are only talking about cataract, but they also have it for vitro retinal surgery, for laser procedures, et cetera. And I think that we should definitely uh, implement some of these uh, changes in Spain. And uh, I'm open to a discussion here is my email. If, it, if anybody wants to reach me, or I will be happy to, to respond. Thank you. Thank you very much, Borja. Amazing concepts, especially I'm loving the, the concept about increased level of autonomy, right? It's not only about stages, but just to define clearly when 
you know, they are autonomous to do different steps. So if I can share one slide very, very quick, because we are talking, I think there's three or four concepts that keep coming, right? And uh, you were talking about the, the, the magic number. And in the US, as you, as you can see there, you have a certification um, organization, it's called like this. And look at that, for cataract, they, they, they make you do 86, right? That's the magic number. And my humble opinion is with 86 cataracts, maybe you are competent, but there is no way you are, you are a, a cataract surgeon. I'm pretty sure every, everybody agrees. And I will love, especially because we keep coming back to the UK, David. What do you think about what, what are the good things, the, the good things that the UK system has to offer people around the world in this journey of becoming a cataract surgeon? So the UK would be criticized because their training is so long that it's seven years, but our minimum number is 350. And I remember whenever I was a year seven trainee, I had done, I think, 700 and something before I became a consultant. And even then, I hope I was humble and not arrogant to think I can do everything. To mention what Borgia said, I have no interest in speed. I can blind someone in seconds. That's not the point. I want to be safe. And if you're not safe, it will take far longer to sort out the complication than doing things slowly and safely. And I would encourage the juniors in particular, if you get the basics done well, don't worry about your numbers. Your numbers will eventually take care of themselves. Very, very interesting. We have amazing concepts here because I think th th there is a second concept where we, we just keep coming and it's about mentorship, you know, and it, it's about the, the, the name of this organization and the first question we did, right? Mentorship and the power of mentorship. Doctora Kostokowska, uh, Kosto sorry for, for, you know, it's it's hard for us to, to pronounce, Vilhana uh, Kostkova. Uh, she's telling us about having even more than one mentor. And I think that's that's something very actual, right? Because now with technology and all these videos and all these communities, you can actually have one more than one mentor and you can see videos and learn from many people. I think that's very powerful. What do you think, Ishtaki, about that? I actually think that... Uh... You know, seeing uh, I will be talking on this uh, in my talk that uh, I Perfect. prefer to have I prefer yes. to have uh, uh, you so know uh, more, more than one or two views rather than uh -huh. having a single mentor. Uh, you you can see a couple of surgeons like David would do something separately. You are going to do something separately. I might not do you know in your way. Uh, so I have to see all these things, try all these things, and then find out which works best in my hand. So I would prefer that, you know, you have uh, more than one mentor seeing you, overseeing you at least, and you also have the same opportunity. Great. So we're going to go, we're going to go to a video from the Dr. Sharifa. Shan. Mm -hmm. Can yes. I, can I add something about this? Sure. Oh, very sure. quickly? I, I, I totally agree with having more than one mentors being a, one mentor being a, an advantage. Actually, I mean, I always tell my fellow, my young trainees that they should learn the technique that the, 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 the consultant they are with or the mentor they're with uh, knows because you never know when you're going to use it. Uh, I, I had never even heard about Simcoe until I, I arrived in Newcastle. My consultant was using Simcoe to remove the, the cortex. And uh, it was very tricky for me at the beginning. But then moving forward, like a, uh, two or three years later, I had a, a, a case of a cornea transplant with um, um, cataract uh, extraction and uh, I, it, the FACO machine was not working so I had to, to use something to remove the cortex and I, I used the Simco. If I hadn't learned that technique from my time in Newcastle, I would have never been able to remove all the cortex in that case. So I think that you can always learn from every one of your mentors and having more than one is, 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 is a plus.
Perfect. No, I agree 100%. I think that that's to be open minded is going to make this journey so, so much easier. You can have so many different resources to face the sim, a single uh, problem. So, Dr. Sharifa Shan, me too. Are you here with us? We will love. Hi. Hi. Welcome. And thank, you for, thank you for your video. Welcome. Thank you. So, I'm sharing now my screen. Uh, today, I'll talk about capsulorexis, how I learned. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ishtia Kanwar, my mentor, and Dr. Mahmoud Raman Choudhury from Bangladesh Eye Health Center. Okay, so it has voiceover, so I'm now sharing. Central circular carbilinear capsulorexis leaves the signature mark of a phaco surgeon in a patient's eye. The pile of an ideal capsulorexis is creation of a flap, keeping it flat always. Use of the cohesive when needed to maintain the anterior chamber pressure, initial cooling, and the smooth transition at the end, so that we can get a beautiful rexis. It's very easy to get extended rexis. We have to stop there. Change the direction of the flat inward, then pull the edge towards the center. Once the direction is changed, then we can do the rest with usual fashion. The runway exists due to the high intralenticular pressure. I always use chip and blue in these cases. Sometimes I do a single rexis or the orange pill method, where I start small and then enlarge it like an orange peeling out. Double rexes, I feel, is the safest way among all. Here, I did a smaller rexes first, washed out all the loose cortical matter under the capsule, then give bisco, cut tangentially a little, and then did the second rexes. Is double rexis is absolutely safe? No. Here, my rexis got extended and I cut it from the opposite side and made an educate size rexis at the end. Small people, a continuous capsular rexis is the prerequisite. In a very small people, tendential pulling of the flap, place a pivot here role along with the judicious use of the cohesives. But every time I cannot be fortunate enough. Here the rexes get extended under the eyelid and I had to put the eyelid hook and cut the rexes from uh, opposite side. After so now what I do usually is doing rexes one millimeter less than the pupil size or use of the pupil expander before doing it. It's always a challenge to do rexes in sublimation. Here, I started from the opposite side, use sister to, to make a puncture, and then with the forceps, very slowly I proceed. As the lens is obscured under Irish, I use Irish hoop to make it central and then slowly complete it. At pounds, as it bears the flag of my creativity. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. We, we need to invite you a lot more, Sharifa. Huh? That was amazing. <laughs> Thank you. And we love that, you know, very fast, very to the point, transferring a lot of concepts. And we, all, we also have here uh, another friend from, from the community, Dr. Julio Atencio is now a, a cataract surgeon, a very good cataract surgeon. Actually, he did uh, life surgery a couple of weeks ago. You can go and he did life surgery 
the assume. So imagine what is to, to do that, right? L like live surgery, and there's so many people watching you, and you know he was so calm already. But he had something very interesting. He had many mentors, and he 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 just kept going, and you know he would go to Costa Rica to learn from somebody. He would go to Barranquilla to learn from somebody else, and. He, it's a very open-minded surgeon who always wants to learn. Julio, what do you have here for us? Okay, uh, greetings from, from Medellin. Uh, well, my journey started in, in Barranquilla and uh, in what, what I saw here in the poll that, that so many people is worried about, about the number. Um, uh, that happened to me when, when I was in the residence. I have uh, low cases of, of cataract surgery, so I decided to 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 look for a for a place when I can learn uh, more about it. So I have the opportunity to be in Costa Rica with with Dr. Flicker and in the San, San Juan de Dios Hospital in San Jose. So that's where I start my linear curve in, in extra cap. Uh, it, it was in my second year. And then uh, I look for, for a, a good mentor in, in Barranquilla and I start my fellow in, in, in Clinic Ophthalmologica del Caribe with Dr. Scaff. And at, at the beginning, I, I see a, a lot of a lot of techniques, a lot of FACO techniques. But uh, I was thinking, what 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 technique I should master to be to be great, not just competence, just to be great. So when when they teach me the the ultra chopper technique, uh, it was a, a mind changer. So I said, uh, this is. This is the one, and, and I have right now 10 years of experience, and I use the ultra chopper in 95% of my cases. So every time I do, I, I pull the details, uh, I, I more, more redefine the technique, uh, and, and I, as every, every uh, fellow, I start with low risk cases and move forward. And, and do and perform complex cases. And, and since I, I, I left the, the fellow, uh, I, I don't perform extra cap. I always use the ultra chopper and, and, and get the goal that, to perform the surgery with FACO. And I, I have some mentor here in Medellin when I was, the, when I went in my first year of working here, and, and she said to me in a, in a uh, tech talk, in, she told me everything you can perform with FACO. So I said, wow, wow, wow. because right now the, the extra cap is, is uh, you, you need to perform in some cases, but he told me that everything goes, you can do it with FACO. So I said, oh, how can I achieve it? And it, for me, it's a reality. Uh, I started using in all my cases, the ultra chopper, mastering the technique, uh, 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 using the, the, the adequate machines and the instruments, training my staff, the, because in, not in every clinic, the staff know, know this equipment. So I have to train my, my instruments, my nurses to, to then to know the, the equipment and, and it flow. So, uh, for me, this instrument and this technique is great. I, I know how to do all the, the FACO job horizontal, vertical, I, I know, but I don't use it. I, since this is, a, this is a hard rock cataract, but I, I perform in the, in a, in a, in not too soft, but in a mild and normal case, I do the same technique always. So in, in 10 years, I know it, it work and, and in my hand is, is I, I think it's master. <laughs> I, I don't know, but for me it works really great. And, and thanks to all my, my mentors, uh, Dr. Scaff is here, so a big hug and, and then another, in another city. And 
and my other mentor was David Flicker. So, yeah. So Dr. Scaffi is here with us. Uh, he's the mentor of mentors, how I call him, right? Uh, and Julio, but that, that was interesting. So you you went around, you had many mentors, but then you kept one technique, and that, that's that's something I think very interesting that we we should talk about uh, right right now in the future. So right now, Dr. Ischiaki Anwar has a presentation for us, but before he starts, we have another question for the audience. So then again, uh, we want this to be a community. We want that chat to be on fire, asking questions. Tell us. Tell us about your experience. We want to know, because, you know, uh, Dr. Borja was talking about the increases, increased levels of autonomy. And we did talk a little bit about artificialized simulation, virtual simulation. So we want to know if you have access uh, to, to this kind of tools, right? Virtual simulation, artificialized, big eyes, because I, I love the, the pool uh, the pull slide, right, Borja? It's like, because that happened to me, I have to be honest. Right? Like, I did a little bit wet lab, but then one one time they said, okay, that's a cataract. Just go for it. You know, you sit there and you learn. And it was like paralyzed, completely paralyzed. So um, let's see what people think. And Ishtake, you can you can get ready for your presentation. You can share your screen. Ready. Whenever then, you can. Let, we can see if people have some resources. Should I start sharing my yes, screen? Yes. Yes. Let's see the, the results, Lisandro, if, yeah. if they're able. Please, everybody, just rush to, to answer that questions and let's see. Okay. So, you know, interesting. There is a uh, 40% uh, of people here that have uh, access to a virtual simulator. That's good. Six, 60% they don't. Uh, there is kind of interesting. Uh, there, there is 60% access to big eyes, but but like 50-50 to artificial eyes. So I think that these are good insights that we're gonna talk uh, now when you when you end your presentation, Istiake. Yeah, I would love to also hear that if uh, there was any percentage that did not have access to any of these, you know, whether simulator or um, uh, animal eyes. So can you see my screen, Ivo? Perfectly, perfect. Okay. Uh, thank you, Ivo, for the invitation. And uh, I wish we had this sort of session when we were learning. So this is going to be something like a philosophical thought rather than uh, you know what to do. So journey to surgical excellence. This is our aim. Whenever we are starting uh, our uh, training, uh, and we know that ophthalmology is basically a surgical uh, part is so much involved and we want to be you know up there we see all our mentors doing so nice surgery and we always dream that you know how we can become a surgeon like them when we can do a rexis perfectly like uh, our teachers are doing and a couple of things i want to say that you know information is one thing that we have to be looking for information regarding many things you know first i would say that where you want to take up your training like if i say for myself that uh, when i was uh, doing my training 15 years back in our country we did not have many centers that had the opportunity you know had um, audio visual system so i have given up two years of my life uh, doing fellowship in another country you know letting my family and uh, so it was my dream and i was just chasing it so we have to have information that where we are going to have uh, good training where we can find a good uh, mentor who is going to be beside uh, the training and uh, i was very lucky i was trained by dr vasavada he used to always stand by us you know his own patient we were operating and uh, another thing is that uh, we have to be very open-minded. That's what I was saying, that just not focusing, maybe my mentor is doing in one uh, method, but we should also look at how other surgeons are doing. And there are so many platforms now, YouTube, iTube, FECO Mentors, uh, thanks to you. And we have to have a very keen observation. Observation on the things that, what I feel that uh, uh, when I'm uh, training now, I see that most of the trainees have difficulties in same steps. 
you know at some point the rex is run away this happens at in case of most of the trainees so very good observation is required so you observe your senior trainees also you know who is maybe six months uh, uh, has joined six months earlier to you how he is dealing in that part and then practice and uh, there are a couple of ways that you know that last question was that how uh, you should practice and another thing is learn from mistakes if you make a mistake you know you have to try to find out why it happened and how to overcome that and best thing would be not making a mistake for yourself so see other people what complications they are doing what mistakes they are doing and learn from it so you know and come out of your comfort zone sometimes we are comfortable doing a thing in some ways but we have to try to see how other people are doing and we should try that also and aristotle has said nicely that excellence is not an act but a habit so we have to make habit you know making a thing specific lead that way that try to sit on a temporal side or superior side fix that and keep repeatedly doing that until you become a master in that so you know keep on trying and uh, like uh, your part in usa or uk we here in asia uh, we don't have the virtual simulators so we are mainly dependent on our animal friends you know try this go in the wet lab and before you do something on human eyes practice and when you are confident that you can do it in a goat eye then you start doing in a human eye and also i would say that doing it step by step you know sometimes what happened when we were uh, doing our uh, residency we used to get you know maybe one case in a week and we had the pressure that one you have to finish that case i totally did not agree with that but rather we should be given step by step so first you give incision once you are confident in incision you move on to rexis then go step by step so that when you are doing rexis you should be only concentrating on that so the steps before that you have mastered and you don't need any help in that okay you were with this i would end actually i would stop sharing this thing Thank you very much, Ischeke. Also, amazing concepts. We have a, another video from a colleague from Argentina. So as you can see, you know, we have people from everywhere. Uh, the key here is to understand that this journey is different depending where you're from. It could be a long journey, but with 700 cataracts for David, it could be a short one, but we you know what, 40, 50 for, for us. So, you know, we actually one here to, to, to get to conclusions or to principles of what works and how we can do it faster and, and you know, more efficiently. Mauro, it's, it's great to have you here. So we would love to, to hear about your journey becoming a cataract surgeon. Hello, everybody. Well, I am Mauro Panichelli from Argentina. So I, I don't want to make a master class because I, I, I saw very good videos from the audience. What I want to share is my lead experience and what changed my mind and what changed my, my way to see how to learn uh, cataract surgery. Uh, I have the lucky to, to spend a, a little time with Evo uh, in Mexico City and make a lot of simu simulation a lot of artificial eyes and pig eyes. And what I learned, it's, uh, I, th I thought that the only way to uh, learn cataract surgery is one patient and human eyes. And I, I can change that because we, when you use uh, simulation and artificial eyes, you are more confident with your technique. You can uh, improve your, your uh, abilities. So that's what, what I want to, to share with you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mauro. And we're going we're gonna to talk about this because I remember when Borja came to me and present himself, you know, we were in Barcelona talking. 
and he said, you know, I, I, I have to be named Borja Isis Salvador because he loves simulation, right? So let's talk a little bit about that. Um, let, let's let's see what, what you think about that, David, because you, you guys are doing a lot with simulation there. So I think simulation means safety. If you think of it with your relative and they're about to have an eye operation and you say, this junior doctor who has not practiced this technique wants to put instruments inside your eye. That seems crazy. Change that conversation round. This junior doctor who has completed module A and B on the simulator, who has put 40 hours of work in, who has done 100 rexuses, is now going to do the stages of the operation which they are safe and trained to do. That's fine. And I agree with the comments earlier about you do it in a modular repeating way. The danger in a training situation, if you say this is the trainee's case and it goes wrong, then it has a whole week of stress before they get their only one opportunity to operate again. Whereas if the trainee does every single case, the same stage, they build it up. And so it builds their confidence. And then they start adding those stages together. And then all of a sudden, they've done half the operation. And I would just want to add that, you know, one complication will set you 10 cases back. You know, I remember my first complication, it happened during a hydro. So there was a, a nucleus drop. And... Uh, during my training period. So I was afraid to do a hydro, you know, even after 30 cases of that. So, you know, making a complication will set you back. Uh, just one thing uh, I would like to know to David that do you have to, in uh, UK, do you have to tell the patients that a trainee is going to operate on part of the operation? Do you have to uh, tell that to the patients? It's part of the consent process, but again, it's how you say it. You explain that this doctor is a member of my team. They will help me in the operation and they will do the stages which they are trained to do. Great. And I think that uh, following that uh, comment from David, uh, we should not be afraid of, of, of guiding that person. I mean, uh, we, yes, we do uh, local anesthesia and the patients are awake. But there are a lot of ways of, of, of giving a, a good guidance without the patient panicking. It's about uh, how you say things. And, and, all, and, and, and what I say to my, my patients is that when they enter in the operating room, they say, look, here is the doctor, whatever. Here is the nurse. Here is. So you will hear us talking. And if they ask a question, you say, no, everything is going fine. No worries. I mean, we're just like uh, talking and even having a conversation afterwards when, when you review that case in the in the in the clinics is very helpful. I would like to just add a, a very th uh, quick thing. I kind of like agree with Mauro with the fact that it is true that uh, there is no simulator that can uh, substitute real surgery, but I still, uh, I, I strongly agree with what David said and what uh, uh, Dr. Anwar said about uh, simulator equals safety, because uh, whatever you do in the simulator in a safe environment, um, where, where, where you can get those skills, uh, that will help you in real life. I mean, we're talking about three millimeters space uh, in which you have to be very fine. Your movements have to be very, very, very careful. And it's not the same doing it in a video game than doing it in real life. So um, yeah. I think that let's, simulators, whatever the simulator about, is. I think it's very important, Boha. Let, let's talk a little bit uh, just in, in the last couple of minutes about this. The first thing is, what are we trying to do here? We, we actually are trying to build a community, but a community for surgeons from all over the world. So we really want people from every single country tell us, telling us about their experience, about their journey, and how we can improve that. You know, right now, I mean, we can have David here, you know, has an amazing experience in, in a long uh, training system, but but very safe. With, it's very safe. I think it's it's amazing. And then we can have you know, experience from all colleagues from all over the world. So if you take a picture in there, you know, you can give us our data and we want to know about you. What do you want 
to personalize what do you want. And if we can connect you with a mentor that is close to you, right, that's even better. So that's the real uh, objective of fake mentors. And, you know, to, to end, it, this is how my grandfather, who was a surgeon, learned, right? And really, I had to learn cataract surgery. I think it was kind of the same. As was Borja was saying, I was pushing to the pool, right? And right now, I think you have a lot of uh, different tools. And look at that. That's, that's how a, a surgical ecosystem or a classroom looks like. Imagine you learning with a simulator, with a colleague next to you, you know, watching at you and giving you some tips and a mentor walking around. I'm not telling you that you're, you're going to be 100% cataract surgeon after this, but I can tell you that you will know what to do and what to expect and, you know, uh, the ergonomics, how to put your hands. So I think there's an important uh, key here. Our, our true uh, um, our true dream is to take the patient outside the, the, the equation. I think we're talking about that, right? It's like, what if I can learn but with the patient not being there? And then when I go to the patient, I know what to do. I'm prepared, right? Not only, and this is the important thing, not only my hands know what to do, but I also have the cognitive skills. I have the decision-making and the problem-solving skills for every single situation. We did we did one a couple of weeks weeks ago with, with David about challenging cases and how to think in those cases. That was amazing, guys. If you didn't see it, go back and see it. And we're giving you experience. We, we can transfer experience, right? What to do. David said it, right? I, I love that. Let other people do mistakes. Learn from the mistakes, but from other people, not your own. I think that's that's very interesting. And finally, we're going to do a little bit about this, about the mental preparation, the mindset skills, how you can be in, the, in a peak performance states every time you do surgery. We did, we did even webinars about nutrition. Do you, do, do you have a, the correct, you know, way to, what to eat the day before and that morning when you're doing cataract cases? That's, a, that's the real uh, objective with this community. Um, you know, uh, we don't have a relationship with the ICs and we, 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 don't, we don't, it's not about the machine, right? It's about what surrounds that machine, that, that ecosystem, that mentor talking to you, you doing a capsulorexis 50 times or what, 100 until you get it right. So you're learning that by repetition and with objective feedback. That's very important. And there's some colleagues around the world now telling that they will warm up in simulation in order to be in a very good state for the first cases. Um, uh, this is something uh, that, you know, it was done in the UK by John Ferris. I think the, the one who can really talk about this is David. Um, he knows about this research. And I think the numbers talk about, you know, the, the, themselves. What do you think about this research, David? Well, I'm slightly biased because I use some of my work to get his costs, but basically they looked at the complication rate in surgery by trainees in the first and second year and, and looked at the rate in those who had previous practice on a simulator versus those that didn't and showed that the complication rate was significantly less because the trainees knew what they were doing because of simulation. When you then put a price in that, it makes the simulator look much cheaper because you're not spending money to deal with the complication and the fallout. So I think it's the first time someone has showed that simulation is cost effective and helps the patient. Exactly. I remember talking with, with John Ferris and he actually said the number that the government was saving by this 38% of reduction in, in posterior capsular breaks, right? This is very powerful. Um, so I just wanted to, to show you, you know, a real fast, um, let's, let's take the, but, but I, from, from the guys who are not uh, familiar with the simulator, I'm there doing a capsular braxis. But what I wanted to show you is that, uh, think about the teaching tool that it is, right? You can see there that my hands position needs to be perfect. My ergonomics need to be perfect. I'm watching in 3D there. And I also have another, I can have another um, person next to me 
do, you know, given me feedback. I think this is very important. This is, uh, did you have any comments, Borja, that you also love simulation to teach? Well, I, I've, I've actually been involved in, in, in instructorship in our hospital, in our institution. I mean, we had the, uh, a couple of residents and, and several other um, ophthalmologists from uh, many places in the world who came specifically for the, for the simulator. And I do believe that even though the simulator is designed to be kind of like a self teaching machine, you get most out of it if you have somebody correcting uh, what you were saying, the position of your hands, the, uh, since you can see it in, on the screen, whenever I was like teaching the residents and when I was instructing the residents, they would perform much, much better than whenever they were doing it on their own, especially at the beginning. So um, it's a very useful tool. Great. And just to finish, uh, Ishtiake, I will love your comments. This is something we did also with, with John Ferris, and it's also about, uh, about some data about the UK. But we were talking about competency, right? We were talking about being a good surgeon and, you know, we'll, we'll do a capsule rhexis, do a, any technique to extract the nucleus. But about, what about complications? Do they, do they teach us to manage complications? Because I actually have seen fellows, right? Like these guys that they give one year only for cataract surgery. And every time they have a complication, they will be removed because the, the, the important thing is safety for the patient. So how do you learn or are you confident in doing anterior vitrectomy? What, what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, that's a very important thing because uh, in the learning process, you're going to make that and it, if, if every time you hand it over to your mentor to handle it, you're never going to learn it. So we have something uh, called FACO development program in our center. Uh, this is a uh, program uh, in six or seven countries that we have. And uh, after they complete the primary program, they are uh, put into this. So there will be drill. Uh, they will be knowing that how to do anterior vitrectomy, how to put a CTR with all this complication. And not only with the surgeons, this is, uh, you know, this is a holistic approach. So the OR people are also with them. So if it happens, they, they will know how to handle the machines, what instrument are needed, how to dilute the TA, everything. So it's very important that you also know and have a drill of that also, not only the uh, routine things, but after you are competent in that, you know, how you manage uh, the complications, you should also learn it in the same way. Very, very good one. But but since you're talking about that, I, I want you, David, again, to talk about the fire drill concept, that it's amazing. I think everybody who's here will, will need to know about this. Yeah, so because our technology is now so good, the complications get less and less. So everybody in the room doesn't know how to set up or practice of to deal with vitreous loss. So we would recommend running a fire drill where you simulate it, you have the necessary adjuncts, the vitrector, the triamcinolone, the suture on hand, so that whenever there's a complication, rather than making a panic and make it worse, people know to just open the little emergency kit, set it up safely, address it safely, and deal with it safely. And so you don't make a situation worse. Great. So, so to finish this concept, I think, you know, we're talking about anterior vitrectomy, how we can prepare for that, how we have a, a specific, you know, a manual to what to do step by step, then we can train in virtual simulation. So imagine it changes completely, something that you're not used to because it happens in a low frequency and you're scared about it and the outcomes, then you, you know what to do, you're trained to know what to do, you're relaxed because you have a, the correct mindset. And then everything changes, right? So just to finish, you know, these are these are objective uh, outcomes in the simulator when you're doing anterior vitrectomy. You can also, you know, have some benchmarking. You can understand that journey with metrics. You can see, you know, how your student is doing, if the scores are correct. You're, you're going to have challenges, uh, like a cataract case and challenges to do some benchmarking. And remember, guys, right, in those specific cases, it's not like, you you know, you're not going to race to the occasion and you're going to have, you know, divine help to, to, to solve that eye. It's not, you're going to go back to the level of your training. So I think that's that's very important. And just to finish, you know, we have a, the, the last uh, video 
and it's about not only managing complications, but um, what to do when, okay, uh, they teach you how to do cataract surgery. Now you want to put multifocals. Now you want to put torix. Did it teach you that in, in, in residency? Uh, do you have the correct skills to, to, you know, as a cataract surgeon that you're in a comfort zone, try to put torix and then to put multifocals. So we have amazing, an amazing video from Dr. Jorge Hernandez. Let's see if we can see it. And it's about his, his journey and in, in what to do in these special cases. Let's see if we can see about the video, the, the audio, because Zoom can, can be mean with us sometimes with the audio of, of videos. Let's see if runs. And technique. Here I'm gonna to try to share my journey on stigmatism. A long time ago, we used to do LRI and they actually work really well. Still do them sometimes. I was an early adapter of the Toric IOL. It's not running. I'm uh, thinking measurement, think price. I'm telling you, Zoom needs to, you know, needs to learn a lot and a little bit in the future, but always, you know, have some problems with videos. Let's see if it if it runs, but if, if it doesn't, we, we, we could talk about the panel about that, you know, right? What do you do when you have new devices? What do you do when you have new techniques, when you need to put a Toric IOL? Let's see there. Uh, no, it's a no-go. And Jorge is here with us. He's been sleeping. I'm gonna, we're gonna try to to show that video probably in the future, because there is always a problem with videos in Zoom. We we knew that uh, since the beginning. So uh, again, let's let's see, Borja. Uh, what do you do? Because you were you know doing like that with with your head. You know, you need to learn Torix. You need to le you need to learn about trifocals. What do you do? Uh, in my case, I I learned it. I learned briefly how to, to uh, implant a toric IOL during my fellowship, and the rest has been like a, kind of like a, during my clinical practice as, an, as a consultant. It's true that the first cases I was lucky enough to have a good mentor uh, who would pay attention to the very small details on how to mark the uh, where the, the the axis of the of the toric IOL. And uh, I've been using those because they've been very, very helpful to me. And uh, in the case of multifocals, it's basically I've learned uh, through experience and, and mostly through through meetings. I mean, uh, I've, I, listening to the experts is the is one a very, very powerful tool to learn how to um, to put uh, multifocal IOLs in, in your patients. Great, uh, David, other tips? Well, I showed you my roadmap. So just because you're qualified doesn't mean that you're competent in everything. And it's a lifetime of learning. So you need to have the first, the mental attitude. I don't know everything, I can learn from others. So if there's a new technique, you read about it. That's what the journal articles are for, which are peer reviewed. You don't just listen to the rep who's gonna sell you something, you watch a video. And when we're speaking about videos, I'm less interested in perfect videos. I'm more interested in videos that weren't quite perfect to see what to do, which is why I showed you that Malugan ring scroll not going in, because you want to learn from other people's experience. So you want to be new, but you don't want to be an early adopter who causes problems. Let other people make the mistakes. Use the third generation but have that mentality to check it out. And I went on the simulator after the COVID lockdown before I went back in the eye. You know, you need to have this constant attitude of refinement, improvement, aiming for excellence. Because if that was your relative, that's what you'd expect your surgeon to do. Great, some last comments, Ishtiake? Yeah, perfectly. I would, I would say that, you know, I uh, watch other videos and uh, I could not agree more with David that uh, look out for the videos that, you know, they had problems and how they overcame. As I was saying that, you know, mistakes are somehow, I don't know, repeatedly done. So it's more like that you will have a face a problem in that step. So watch that and uh, watch videos and uh, peer reviewed journals if you want to use something new. 
Very good one. So everybody who, who is here with us, you know, remember fakeomentors.com. That's the community present in all social media. Um, we're going to try to do uh, activities like this every if it was for me, I will do it every day, you know, but, you know, we need to have other things too. And we're going to try to do it uh, through seven or 10 days. So, you know, uh, thank you, Mauro, Dr. Maria Belen, Sharifa, thank you for being here with us. You have any, any last comments? Because I think the important here is I, I would like everybody in the panel to just say one thing that can improve um, the surgical journey for everybody who is watching here. You can start, David. You're in the top left. Um, my last slide said it. You can only say a case is simple when it's completed safely. So don't allow yourself to get arrogant. I can do surgery quickly. Remember every single patient, you want to do your best for them. And that is safe. It's not necessarily slow, but it's safe and efficient and effective. Thanks, David. Thank you very much. Uh, Broha? I would say focus on quality uh, over quantity. Uh, numbers will come with experience, but uh, as long as you know how to do things with, with excellence, you will have uh, very, very um, low uh, rate complications. So quality uh, over quantity. Thank you. Dr. Maria Belen? Any last comments? No, she didn't listen. Mauro, you have any comments? Yeah, what I uh, was better for me in the in my journey to become a, a better uh, surgeon uh, was practice, practice, and more practice. And what gives you that? It's the the simulation and the and not to practice in a human eyes. I think that's the, 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 the goal and the what well, can, and we, uh, I said that we are very lucky because we have uh, the chance to become surgeons uh, with those possibilities that I think a, a few decades uh, before we, 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 they don't want, they don't have, so, I think that the simulation it's it's the a great uh, tool for for becoming a, a great surgeon. Thank you very much, Julio. Uh, well, uh, a key point to to maximize your learning curve for me is is try to to record your surgeries and then go to your home and see what you do and and try to to pull the, the details, uh, try to do better incisions, but you only you only get that if you record and then uh, look on the other day to know what you're doing. Because uh, if you don't uh, record the surgery, it's, it's on the air. So you need to have, to have that to, to improve your skills. Thank you very much. Ishtiake? I would say that don't rush, you know, consider that you are operating on your parent's side. So what you would not do in your parent's side, don't do it in, on the patient's side. Don't rush, be very stable and go slow. Thank you very much. Sharifa, are you still here with us? Yeah, I'm here. Uh, I think have patience and uh, learn stepwise, like uh, take time to learn every step and review it. Every time you do, review your video with your mentor or any senior, what is wrong with you, that, what is right with that, and then proceed forward. That's the main thing, I think. Thank you very much. So we're, we're, we're gonna finish. I will just wrap up all the concepts, but I think, you know, try to take the patient outside the learning curve, the equation, right? Try to learn everything you can without the patient. Uh, you said it, Mauro, practice. I will add deliberate practice. Just perfect practice makes perfect, right? You need to practice, but in a certain way with a certain methodology. Remember that it's not only about moving your hands, but about the decision-making process and about the mental state in that specific moment. Um, 
And I, I really like what you said, Borja, about the increased levels of autonomy, okay? The benchmarkings with milestones. You're always measuring what you're doing, what, with what you guys said with video, with a mentor, with a spreadsheet, but then, you know, you, you just know which, which are the steps you need to go before and then and then after. Guys, thank you very much for your time. We will be talking about this like three or four hours because we love this subject, but we need to finish and, and we will wait for you in the in the next webinar. So thank you everybody. Thank you, the panel, for your kind time. Thank you. Thank you, Bye-bye, guys. Take care.